Open Forum. Very pleased to welcome you all to this session. My name is Sharon Brown and I'm the Assistant Director Delivery for the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service and I will be chairing this meeting. I have a number of colleagues who are here. Um, firstly, I'd just like to highlight that we have Councillor Katie Thornborough here. Katie, would you like to say something? Hello everyone, it's really nice to see you all. I hope we're going to have a, a sake. good presentation and a question and answer session. Thank you. And I have another, a number of other officers who are here who I'd like to introduce. So first of all, I have Nigel Blaisby, who is the Development Management Delivery Manager. Nigel? Yeah, good evening, everybody. Similarly, I'm, I'm looking forward to a, a good debate and hopefully um, we'll be able to answer some of your questions. Thank you. We've also got Lorraine Casey, who is one of our DM team leaders. And Lorraine is one of the team leaders who covers the city area. Hi, Lorraine. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Hello. Hi. Lucy. Then, thank you. Then we've got Caroline. <laughs> Hello. Caroline Hunt from our planning policy team. Good evening, everyone. I don't know whether we've got John Dixon here yet. Hello. No. Great. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, joining us shortly, we'll have Hannah Loftus from our communications team, if she's not here already. And we've also got Joanne from our urban design team. Joanne, would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. Good evening. Hi. Hello, everybody. And then lastly, I'd just like to introduce Charlene Harper from our technical support team. Uh, good evening, everybody. Hi. Good evening. So there are um, some other officers who will be listening into the meeting and who may respond to questions during the course of this meeting. That's everyone that's here. Um, the agenda for this meeting is embedded into the meeting invitation, just to draw everyone's attention to that and also to the fact that this meeting is being recorded and so we will make this recording available after the meeting. Um, a few housekeeping issues, if everyone could keep their microphones muted when they're not speaking just so that we maximise the sound quality for everyone um, because otherwise we can get background noise interference um, and just keep them on when you're actually speaking. Uh, we've got a lot of people, so if I could ask everyone to put questions in the chat box, that would be helpful rather than raising hands because that's a little bit more tricky to do where you've got a lot of people at a meeting. And we're happy if you post the actual question uh, in the chat box or that you just say that you've got a question that you would like to uh, ask on a particular item as we go through the agenda. And if we can focus the questions in the chat box on the specific items that we're discussing at the time, that would be really helpful. Uh, some people we are aware have sent us some questions in advance of the meeting. We will do our best to pick up as many of these questions as we go through the agenda under the relevant items. If we can't cover them in detail, then we will follow them up after the meeting. There'll also be some time against each item for questions and a little bit of time at the end of the meeting, fingers crossed, for any additional questions. So I'm now going to move on to the first item, which is a local plan update. Thank you, John and Caroline and Hannah. Well, I'm going to try and share my screen. This is the most frightening part of the meeting for me, so bear with me. This is going to work. Can you see a presentation? I'm hoping you can see some slides. Um, somebody nod if they can. Um, yes, just, yes, there's a... So I had no idea if that was going to work. Um, I'm just going to talk you through a bit about the where we are on the local plan. We've got a couple of slides on Northeast Cambridge 
and then a bit of an update on our housing land supply situation. So this is going to change slide. There we go. So you'll recall that particular diagram which shows the uh, big themes we're really working around on our local plan review and we consulted on them uh, last year. Um, the next step is uh, a preferred options consultation in the autumn and the team are working really hard at the moment trying to get ready for that uh, with a really interesting consultation on what the next steps for the plan should be. Uh, I should emphasize that um, this isn't going to be a draft plan. This is genuinely setting out the preferred approach to the plan, having weighed up all the issues uh, that we talked about in the first consultation, having taken account of uh, your consultation responses and the workshops we held uh, at the end of last year to try and set out what we think the approach to the plan should be to allow you to give your feedback before we actually write the plan and write those policies and so on in the plan. It will set out um, probably structured around those big themes, um, what we think the policy approaches should be, but also what we think um, the growth strategy should be for the plan. So there will be a chance to comment on what we think actually the development should be in the next plan before we draft the plan. So it really is a genuine opportunity to have that level of input before we get to drafting the plan. And we really, you know, we'll be working hard again to get that feedback um, as much as we can doing all these innovative approaches we tried last time and try and learn lessons and get even more feedback this time. I think my next slide is just the timeline to show you where we're at. You've probably seen this one before. So we um, did the uh, first conversation consultation um, earlier in 2020 and we released all the call for sites information and so on, you might recall back in the autumn. Then I think many of you took part in the consultation exercises through the uh, workshops with stakeholders. We did have our, our, following our first uh, major evidence release uh, in the winter, uh, just gone. And then on the next stage of moving on to the preferred options consultation before we analyze all that information and come out with a draft plan, you know, a full draft plan next year. So hopefully that shows you what engagement we've got coming up. Uh, I think Caroline's going to cover off Northeast Cambridge. Yes, thanks, John. So um, alongside the local plan, the team is also working really hard to take forward proposals for Northeast Cambridge. Um, and again, some of you may have been following this plan um, over the last uh, year or two. Um, and as we're moving forwards now, um, we've also, the councils have recently also launched a new community forum. Uh, so more opportunities for uh, people interested in, in uh, this area to engage in, in the process. So the, the, the team currently considering the comments that were made in the consultation on the draft area action plan last year and preparing for the next version of the plan. Um, and that will be um, uh, a committee cycle in, uh, in towards the end of the year to take the proposed submission area action plan. So that's the plan that the councils having considered all the representations that have been received and those will be captured within a consultation statement published alongside a draft plan will will say the plan that the the councils consider should be taken forward um, for the formal stages and ultimately on to examination. But because the area action plan is predicated on the relocation of the water treatment plant, uh, which is a under, going, undergoing a separate process being led by Anglian Water uh, to go through a development control uh, consent order process, um, the area action plan would then pause uh, and wait for the outcome of that process before it would move forwards and if the relocation of the water treatment plant uh, is approved then the area action plan would move forwards to those formal stages um, and so like the uh, local plan um, process on the next slide John please is the uh, just sets that out so we've we've been through the issues and options and a draft area action plan 
that further evidence and, uh, and engagement is, is ongoing at the moment. And that process I've just talked about will be the end of the year and then a pause um, until the end of that uh, outcome of that uh, relocation process uh, before we would then move forward to the latter stages of, of the plan. Uh, so um, I think I've just seen a question come in that may be relevant. Um, will the 2018 local plan be carried forward, uh, uh, policy around this site be carried forward? So um, the new local plan will, uh, will consider what the overall strategy or sort of strategic policy should be for, for North East Cambridge and then um, the area action plan is the plan that looks in in more detail at uh, at the level of detail, including things like the heights of buildings and so on. Uh, so, I think that's it on the area uh, on the area action plan. Back to John for housing supply. So, uh, you may have seen that uh, at the uh, beginning of April we published an updated version of our housing land supply statement and housing trajectory. So we update these statements every year and they're needed to demonstrate we have um, a housing land supply available that's suitable uh, to show that we can uh, deliver on our housing numbers and, our, and on our local plan. So what that includes is updated records on how many homes we've completed each year since 2011 and provides uh, details on what we anticipate the housing completions will be uh, up to 2031 and beyond on a site by site basis. So just to really give you a little bit of background on, on how we do that. So we really follow, it's quite detailed national guidance on how we um, monitor our supply against um, the requirements um, for delivery. Um, we look at sites which are allocated in our development plans, sites which have got planning permission, also those where there's been a resolution to grant. Uh, but we also have in, in our trajectories a windfall land, so those small sites or, or larger ones which come forward following you know, general planning policy rather than having been allocated in the plan. Um, we monitor uh, the completions by literally completing surveys about what's been finished um, around the turn of the financial year each year to understand what, what's been happening, you know, what's under construction, what's happening. And then to assess deliverability, we do an awful lot of work um, understanding what the latest status of sites is. Um, we survey all the developers of sites to understand what their views is and how, what they anticipate actually building out in the next few years. Um, we look at the detailed information from the plan application, whether they've got a performance agreement regarding how these applications are going forward, um, what the ownership is, and other information. We use assumptions which have been gathered based on our local evidence of delivery to put together quite a detailed picture on the delivery on every site. So you'll see in our report, we go to an awful lot of detail and it isn't just based on one thing the developer told us. We put that whole picture in place to give a full understanding of delivery of sites. And the reason we do that is because as many of you know, we have to demonstrate an ongoing um, five year supply position. So can, can we show that we've got a good supply of land that will enable sites to continue to come forward against our established targets? In terms of those, those technical numbers, um, we've now got a 6.1 years of supply. So above that, that five year figure, that's using a technical term, the Liverpool method and a 5% buffer. So they're the sort of margins for error you, for error you need to include in that supply. Um, we think using that 5% is the appropriate approach because uh, it's following updated national guidance. So that statement effectively shows we have demonstrated that we do have a five-year supply. Um, it's likely there will always be challenge to that. So for example, when we get appeals in often, um, Respective uh, developers will try to demonstrate we don't have it. We have got an appeal coming up in June on a site in Sawston, when I'm sure it will come up. But we think, you know, as I said, we've done a lot of evidence looking at this issue and got a very um, detailed land supply statement we'll be using for cases like this going forward. Um, that's the end of my presentation. And I think we'll be moving on to question, Sharon. 
That's right, John. So we've got a number of questions in the chat box. So I think we did the first one. So um, we've then got one. Will the preferred options include a response to the ambitions for the expansion of the Cambridge My Medical Campus as set out in its full vision statement? So in short, the um, preferred option will have to set out what we consider or the council considers is its preferred approach to the future development for the plan period coming up. Um, we've had an awful lot of sites suggested to us, as you know, on our website, and we'll have to show how we've considered those and what our preferred approach is. So in short, that proposal has been put to us, so we'll have to consider you know, what the response to that should be in our local plan and you and and um, developers and so we'll all have the chance to comment on that at this next stage before we draft the plan. Thank you. And then going down, we've got a question about Northeast Cambridge. Now, Caroline, you might want to pick that up. The rationale for Northeast Cambridge was that it would avoid a sprawl of development on the edge of Cambridge. But we now hear about the Science Park North near Houston. How is this justified? Is the planning service really consulting in good faith if the goalposts keep being moved? Uh, so the uh, the issue around a science park north is actually falls under the same sort of category as John just talked about. It's a site that the has been put to the councils as part of the call for sites. It, it, it has no status at, at, at this point in time. Uh, it will be for the councils to go through a process of uh, assessing those as part of the uh, as part of the, the local plan and just to be clear that uh, it's north of the A14 and therefore it's outside the boundary of the northeast Cambridge area action plan so it doesn't form part of the area action plan considerations so it will be down to the local plan to consider whether that should play any part um, in the local plan moving forwards. Thank you. Um, don't know whether we want to add anything about the uh, tall buildings um, and the skyline uh, question in the comments. Anything else to add on that? Uh, not really. I don't think. Uh, um, I think I mentioned that you know that, that that is part of consideration of the type and nature and density and capacity of the site can, being considered by the area action plan. So that does include. Um, evidence to support the plan just so to make sure that we do understand the implications of uh, of the proposals included included within, within the plan thank you and then uh, finally i think on this item uh, how will this new cambridge science park by trinity affect the local infrastructure so the local plan will need to be supported by an infrastructure delivery uh, strategy. So were this site or any other site to be included in it, we'll need to look at what the needs of infrastructure are for those sites and um, how and when when they are needed and how they are delivered and how they can be funded and so on. So should it be included, it will have to be addressed and that sort of work to show how the infrastructure needs can be met. Thank Karen, you. Sorry, uh, it's Hannah here and I'm just keeping my camera off because I'm doing some childcare. But just to comment on that, I think John's point is right, but I think these are very big ifs at this point. I don't think anyone should assume that any of these sites are in the local plan at all. These sites have no status whatsoever until the point at which that plan finally makes it through all of its many, many stages of development. And there's many more consultations as well to come. So whilst the landowners may wish to publicize their various developments and may wish to put some glossy websites out there, just because there's a glossy website doesn't mean it has any status in our books at all um, and, and you guys should really just wait and see what comes out in the preferred options and then the various stages of the plan after that. Thank you very much Hannah, that's really helpful. Um, we did have a few questions in advance of the meeting and we've just got another, another one uh, coming up in the chat box so we'll deal with that one first. So what are the implications of the Queen's speech proposals to change the powers of local councils to block development once the government has made their decision on which land can be built on? Thank you, Linda. Um, that's a really interesting question. So the Queen's speech really, you know, is referring to a, a, a planning bill, which we anticipate possibly later this year 
uh, which will build on the consultation on changes to the planning system that happened last year. And I suspect the question comes from, there were proposals within that to change the nature of local plans to be more about, um, I'm gonna say the word zones, but it doesn't specifically mention zones. It's about identifying specific areas and what might be suitable in specific areas through the local plan um, in a slightly, well, a very different way. Um, we don't know the outcome of that consultation yet or what might form part of this planning bill. But our hope very much is that all the work we're doing on the local plan and North East Cambridge up to this point clearly will give us you know, a strong way forward in being able to evidence what the needs of the area are and how they should be planned for, which we could then adapt to whatever this um, local plan, plan making system ends up being in the future. Thank you. And we had a few questions ahead of the meeting, some of which were planning policy related. Um, I don't know, Hannah, whether you want to pick up some of those. I think we had a question from Wendy about the workshop processes. I don't know whether... Uh, so, yeah, it was a fairly lengthy um, question, Wendy, and so I think we are going to um, send you a, a written response to that just to make sure we get it all down. Um, but, you know, that the, there is a, a, a various reasons why you have uh, an invite list and so forth and then there were some other consultants who were invited to the workshops mainly because they were working on some of the other evidence base and so forth um, which was related um, and with regard to your question about names on the FOI I'm afraid we didn't redact any names we're trying to figure out how that happened we sent off FOI colleagues a totally unredacted name, list of names of, of councillors who attended the workshops and for some reason they redacted them and unfortunately we haven't had time yet to get uh, a response from our FOI colleagues about that but in all good faith we did not try to conceal anything I can tell you. Thank you Hannah. I think then we had another one which is about green infrastructure which was again from Wendy which referred to a message posted on Romsey next door, which had been forwarded by residents. And this said that planning decisions about green infrastructure had already been made. And there was a question about, is this correct? And who'd made this decision? So one of the evidence um, documents that we'll be publishing in the next batch with our preferred options will be the green infrastructure strategy. And by publishing that alongside the preferred options consultation, clearly there'll be the chance to comment on not only the study, but how it's been fed into what the preferred options are to the plan. So there is very much from our perspective and the plan making perspective, the chance to still feed into um, this work. I think the question then moves on to the point about um, Romsey next door. I, I, I was struggling to follow what the question was, but it seemed to be commenting on views on a development which is in a committed development in the existing local plan where clearly those you know that those sites have gone through their full plan making process you know and being considered found sound as part of a development plan and those developments are going through their their normal process so i'm not sure how to comment further on that one sharon i don't know if you could have something to sell no i think i think that's that's fine john um i think if there is more detail then we we can follow that up um I think then I'll just take one more question from the ones that have been forwarded to us in advance of the meeting against this item and then we'll move on to the next item. So I think the next one was from Robert Lawson um, and it says it's clear that development is already putting the Nine Wells, Hobson's Brook, Vickersbrook watercourses under serious pressure. Isn't there a strong case for greater protection through targeted protection measures? and stringent constraints on further development. How can clear proposals be developed? And there's reference to the recent consultants report which identified river corridors as key areas where green infrastructure interventions can bring benefits. Uh, I'll take that one if, if you like. Um, I think in terms of those designations like local nature reserves, I don't personally get involved in that that designation process. There's a clearly a um, a set of requirements that a designation like that would have to meet. But I can comment from a local plan perspective and give give the answer that 
if we were to allocate any specific proposal, we would very much need to understand the impact it would have on um, the environment, biodiversity, landscape, and so on, to understand that those impacts um, could, could be effectively managed and mitigated and so on. Um, so as part of, again, not getting site specific, but as part of any proposal, we would want to understand those impacts and make sure we've responded appropriately in those policies in the plan. And perhaps Sharon, if I could just, just add to that, I mean, one of the key themes identified by the councils and supported through the consultations that we've undertaken is um, an emphasis on biodiversity and open spaces. So those, those priorities that it, you know, local plan, it's not just about development, meeting development needs is, is important, but it's also about that, those wider issues around placemaking and, and, and making sure that we, we are, um, you know, protecting what's special around this area, uh, including from a biodiversity point of view, but also built environment heritage and, and those whole range of, of, of other considerations that make Cambridge um, the special place that, uh, that, that it is. Thanks, Caroline. And finally, just before we move on to the next item, I just wanted to ask Councillor Thornborough whether she'd like to make any comments just about the local plan or anything to do with the items that have come up so far. Oh, I, I, the nice clear answers. Uh, Wendy, I was at one of the um, workshops. Um, I, I had hoped to get to more, but I only ended up going to one of them. But um, and the, that when you get the list, you'll see the ones that, that I went to, but um, it was very interesting, the one I went to. Um, I was going to comment on the, on the one about the allotments, which is coming up, but I'll wait till you've done the answer. Okay. Um, what I'll do with the allotments one is, is deal with that one into the, um, at the end of the meet, uh, towards the end of the meeting under the, the more general miscellaneous questions. Um, so that's fine. So I'm going to move on now to Joanne Preston's item, uh, which is a design review update. So thank you to John and Caroline for that really helpful local plan, Northeast Cambridge update. And over to you, Joanne. Thanks, Sharon. Now it's my turn to attempt to share my screen. Let me know when you can see it. Can you see that? Not yet. I uh, can now. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, I'm going to be talking to you about design review. Um, and I think some of you may be aware of what design review is, but I'm going to go back to basics for any of you who might not be um, so sure about it. I'm also going to talk about design review and how it operates in the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service area. And at the moment, we're carrying out a review of the existing service. So I'm going to kind of talk about why we're doing that. Um, and what, what stage we're at with it. And there'll be some time for questions at the end, hopefully. So, well, what is design review? Well, it's an essential part of the planning process and it's recognized as such in the national planning policy framework. And this is what it looks like really. Um, it's essentially um, an applicant presenting their proposal, ideally in the early stages, at pre-application stages, to a panel of independent and impartial experts in the built and natural environment. Those experts carry out a site visit often. They'll then um, receive a presentation from the applicant and they will provide advice um, on how that scheme can be improved. And the advice is written in a letter, um, which is for um, planning officers, developers, and the design team, and also for planning committee members. Um, and so that letter is attached to planning committee reports and delegated reports, um, so it's available to the public to see as well. And importantly, it's, it's an independent and expert process. Um, so these are kind of professionals who are highly regarded in their fields, um, reviewing a the scheme, there's a strict conflict of interest procedure around it, they're acting independently of us as, as officers. It acts as a critical friend to all parties. Um, it's aiming to improve um, schemes rather than redesign them. It's working in the public interest. It's advisory. The letter is attached to the delegated and committee reports, as I've already said. And the idea is that the advice contained within that letter gives decision makers the confidence and informa information to support high quality and innovative designs, but also to resist poorly designed schemes. 
and it shouldn't be seen as a replacement from the, for the other tools that we use, such as pre-application advice. It should all be kind of working together as part of a sort of ecosystem of tools and processes to help support good design. So this is just one of the many tools that we use to support that process. And I mean, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but I just want to kind of say that it's been around for a really long time as a way of improving design. So I think it uh, was established in 1924 by the Royal Fine Arts Commission, who started reviewing um, major developments from the early um, sort of uh, from the early noughties. It, it was largely funded by the government through the Commission for the Architecture and the Built Environment Service. And then from 2011 onwards, um, it, the government stopped funding the service. So now it's often paid for by applicants. And today, because of that, there are different ways that design review can be provided. So there's been a marketization of it. So sometimes it's provided by external providers who do that service for the council. And sometimes it's the council who have their own in-house service. And because there's lots of different ways that it can be provided, um, the Landscape Institute, the RTPI and the RIBA have come up with these um, best practice principles for design review. So they're the kind of professional bodies um, that, that operate within this sector and they've come up with these 10 principles that all design review panels um, should operate within. And so they should be independent, expert, multidisciplinary, accountable, transparent, proportionate, timely, advisory, objective and accessible. And this was produced in 2013, but today these are still kind of regarded as, as a best practice approach. And there's been lots of research to suggest that design review works really well. The, the research that has been done is largely focused around London, but it still is relevant to the, the rest of the UK. And so the research has shown that design review leads to better design projects and places. It brings about a cultural change where design review, sorry, better design is seen as the norm. It leads to a more collaborative design process with more empowered designers. It speeds up the formal planning process by highlighting issues really early on in the, in the process so that they can be tackled um, from the offset. It provides endorsement for the promoters of challenging projects and it gives greater confidence to um, public sector decision makers to support innovation. And it also, there's an opportunity for learning for everyone involved. So because you have these experts providing this advice, it's a really good way for officers and the public um, councillors to learn about what is good design. But for it to work well, it needs positive engagement from everyone involved. So that means the applicant and the design team addressing the concerns of the panel, decision makers taking the concerns seriously and ensuring that they've been addressed. Officers having a continued focus on delivering design quality beyond design review. So it's, it's not the end of the conversation, it's the beginning. And the public having confidence in the process. So that's obviously achieved through transparency over how the panel is run and managed. And also um, about the advice letter communicating the findings in a really accessible way. So within the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service, we've got three design review panels. They're probably most familiar with the Design and Conservation Panel, which was set up in 2006, I believe based on an earlier panel that was actually set up in the 1970s. Um, so that operates within the Cambridge City Council area and it reviews significant schemes within that. There's the Cambridge Equality Panel, which is a county-wide panel, and that um, operates um, so it's, so it's countywide, it's set up in 2010, and that um, reviews significant projects that have a, um, an infrastructure emphasis, so things like schools, um, transport interchanges. And within Cambridge City, it's things that go to the Joint Development Control Committee. And then there's also the Design Enabling Panel, which operates within the South Cambridge District Council to review significant schemes there. So um, just a little bit more information about each of these panels. The Design and Conservation Panel was set up in 2006 and it largely reviews education, student accommodation, hotels and commercial buildings. It meets monthly and it conducts on average about 12 reviews a year. It's a free to, to use service at the moment. The panel members aren't paid for their time and it's made up of a small pool of panel members. There are about 13 of them and they're put forward by the professional organisations such as the Royal Institute of British Architects. Um, the advice 
is issued in a letter, um, but it's also their advice is presented with a red, amber, green rating. So the panel members vote at the end of the review um, on whether a scheme is, is red, which means it needs significant improve, um, improvements to be made. Amber, which means that some improvement is made and um, green means, it still means that improvements need to be made to be honest. <laughs> but, um, it's in principle, um, it's, it's kind of acceptable and minor changes. The Cambridge Quality Panel, um, it meets about six times a year. It has its own terms of reference um, and it's, it's governed by the Cambridge County Council. So that reviews projects such as stations, transport, interchanges, bridges, new schools. And it may also review policies and guidance documents that have a strategic or spa spatial implications at a sub-regional scale. So things like the wing um, master plan and the wing design code. And then the design enabling panel was set up in 2014. So this is the South Cambridgeshire District Council panel that you're probably least familiar with. Um, but it's important to say that it is a part of our service now as a Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service. Um, so that was established in 2014 and it reviews about 22 schemes a year. Um, and it has a much larger pool of members, I think about 35 members. So as two, so the design and conservation panel and the design enabling panel are both operated by councils that have come together to form the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service. Um, and both of them have now been operating for over five years without a review. Um, we've been carrying out a review into the service to make sure it's still meeting um, best practice. And so we appointed an independent expert consultant um, called Esther Curland, who's um, very experienced in design review, um, to carry out the review of the two panels. And we asked her to look at three options. So she looked at whether the panels should continue as they are at the moment with two different formats operating um, for Cambridge um, City Council and South Cambridge District Council areas. A single panel for the two areas or two different panels but with a common administration. And as part of that review we carried out engagement through surveys and interviews and um, hopefully um, many of you will receive the survey that went out about that. And this was the feedback that we got. I mean, overwhelmingly, the feedback that we got from residents associations and parish councils within South Cambridge District Council was that um, we need to do more to communicate um, the activities of the panels. So I think 67% of respondents hadn't heard about the Cambridge Equality Panel the, or the Conservation Panel or the Design Enabling Panel. But about 60%, um, sorry, 90% um, wanted to find out more. So that's something that we, want, we need to improve. There's a need for a consistent approach um, to kind of charging across the panels. So the city council panel is free at the moment, whereas the South Cambridge District Council panel charges to use. And also a consistent approach to the way that we give feedback. So at the moment, the South Cambridge District Council feedback is more kind of qualitative, whereas the city council one has the voting, the red and the green. Um, there's a real need to kind of encourage people to come for review earlier and come back for more reviews so that the panel can actually see how the schemes evolved and give advice based on that. Applicants um, and agents that we spoke to said that cost isn't so much of an issue for them and they will pay for a good quality service and it is actually quite common now. I mean it, it's actually it's the norm to pay for this so the fact that we're not charging in the city is quite unusual. Um, we need to use the panel to improve training um, for members, officers and the panel as well. So, um, so for members and officers, it's using the panel to help provide training about design. And then for the panel, it's actually us training them about our policies so that the advice that they're giving are in line with that. There's a need for more diversity on the panel. And there's also a need for diversity in terms of um, the expertise. So, for example, we need more sustainability and higher base expertise. And so we are putting together proposals for a new panel based on those recommendations um, and we're going to put that to committee um, to decide on in June and so this is the proposal that we're going to kind of put forward to the committee so it's a single panel with sub panels which may be um, created according to typology so for example um, 
common typologies that are seen within uh, the city or within the South Cambridge Digital Council area. There's going to be a pay to use service um, that we're going to manage in house. And the fact that it's going to be paid to use means that we can properly resource it and make sure that we do all of the engagement, which I think we all agree has been lacking um, because we haven't, it hasn't been properly funded previously. We're going to recruit a new panel of 20 to 30 members to make sure we have the right diversity and expertise. And we will encourage existing panel members to reapply if they want to continue. We're going to start paying our panel members because we think that's really important. They're giving up their time. Um, and I mean, it, we, we wouldn't be paying them the amount that they would earn in their day jobs, but it's just something to recognize that. And that's very common now um, across design review. And we'll be um, updating the referral criteria to make it a bit clearer. So that will be based on projects that are significant um, to do with their size or because their um, site is a particular heritage concern. And we're gonna move away from the traffic light system because it gives the sense that it's for the panel to sort of sign off projects and it's not, the panel is, is there to provide constructive advice. So that's something that um, the expert consultant said is, is, is not a very common approach and does not meet the best practice guidelines. We're going to improve our communication through updating the website and making sure that we keep on top of that. I think um, at the moment the website isn't updated as regularly as it should be. And we're going to kind of uh, continue to monitor um, and improve that. So there'll be an independent advisory group established so that they can continue to monitor how the panel is performing against best practice and make and recommendations for improvements. And this is where we are in the process really. So um, we've, we've done our engagement. Um, we have got the review and recommendations report by the external consultant and we're, we're almost ready to go to committee in June. And if it is approved by committee, um, then we'll start recruiting with panel members in August, November, and we will hope to launch a new panel in early 2022. Um, questions? Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Um, so the first one is from Andrew Milbourne. And uh, we've got a question just asking about residents being consulted early in the process and are there plans? So how are residents being engaged in this process? What's the best way for residents to engage? So can I just clarify the question? Is that residents being engaged in the review of the service or actually in the, the panel as it meets? Well, I, I think what I mean is that, you know, developers, uh, have early on discussions with, with planners and obviously now you've got this review guide, but the first chance residents get to actually look at, discuss the situation is when it's actually put in as a natural planning permission mm -hmm. proposal. And I think it would be fair and better if residents were, uh, you know, consulted by, by these parties, you know, right, right at the outset, really. You know, we're the people who are excluded until the end. But we, we do actually live here and it does affect us very greatly often and particularly with the amount of growth we've had. Um, and I think there's you know a fair amount of frustration with the consultation process I think and that's putting it mildly really. Mm. So sorry Sharon do you want to go? Um, I was just going to talk about it generally and then maybe you, you could chip in Joanne. So um, developers are required under the Localism Act to carry out consultation in advance of major applications being submitted. Um, we also encourage um, developers where there are um, proposals that have wider public interest to carry out pre-submission consultations with local communities and also local members and emphasise that that is extremely important. So someone's mentioned, for example, um, Silver Street um, toilets, and, and obviously that's a, a scheme that um, there was a considerable level of, of interest in. So certainly that is our position and that that is the view that officers and local members very much take in directing developers to that approach. Um, Joanne, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Just that we did ask um, the independent consultant to consider the role of communities in the design review panel 
And one thing that they said is it's really important that it is an expert panel, that that is what design review is. So it wouldn't be appropriate for community members to sit on that panel. I think one thing that we do know that we need to do is improve the communication around the panel's activities um, so that if people know where to go to be able to read the letters that the panel have produced. Um, that's, they're not always uploaded at the moment and they're not always attached in full to committee reports and things. So that's that. those sorts of processes are things that we will be improving, I think. Thanks for that. And then the next question from Wendy Blythe. Does that correlate with the quality charter? Has there been any review of the charter's five Cs? And there's an example there, um, Nine Wells and CB1 station uh, developments and Cambridge Leisure Centre and Great Knighton. I'm not sure the Cambridge Leisure Centre was um, was kind of subject to the the, um, <laughs> the quality charter review, but um, certainly some of the other schemes that are mentioned would have been. So Joanne, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, so the, the proposal for the new panel, we are proposing that it, it um, gives feedback based on the headings of um, the four C's, so the Cambridge Equality Charter. And that's because we find that that, um, for the quality panel, has been quite successful in providing a really holistic approach to design. It doesn't get kind of bogged down in stylistic detail, um, which can sometimes happen otherwise. Um, so it, it tackles kind of, it, it's, been, it's been quite a successful um, approach and it, um, it kind of also helps to create a consistency about the way that we give our feedback as well across the service. Mm -hmm. And I'd, um, I can add as well that um, the strategic developments, as Joanne said, so even as long ago as that clay farm development that was assessed against the quality charter, as was the Nine Wells development. Uh, CB1 is a bit interesting because it came along a bit before the quality charter. So I don't think certainly the early part of the CB1 development and the outline um, was um, a, a assessed directly against the quality charter itself. And obviously that was reviewed under the, the City Council's design panel rather than the uh, quality panel. And then we've got, um, I'm not sure it relates to this item. I think this is just a general question. Uh, where will the Global Cambridge Epicentre be in 2050? That's a big question. C Councillor Thornborough. <laughs> well, I would like it to be focused on the River Cam in 2050. I hope it's going to be a glorious, beautifully flowing river that we all continue to appreciate with beautiful landscaping along its banks and, and, and more reserves. Um, nature reserves and really good um, walking and cycling links to other nature reserves um, beyond Cambridge. So that's what I would like the epicenter to be. So I um, love to hear from the rest of you and let's make it really beautiful. I think we could probably have an ongoing dialogue about this. <laughs> as a kind of follow-up to the meeting with everyone putting their comments into the chat and seeing what we all collectively come up with. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. It's a really good topic for um, discussion. So just moving down, I think, um, from Jean Glasberg, it seems especially important for residents also to be consulted early when it's an application that has a significant impact on them. And again, that was the point we touched on earlier, and this could make the process more democratic. Early engagement could also improve the outcome. I do have to say that planning committee members do, do ask about the engagement with developers at pre-application stage at planning committee meetings when applications are decided. That is a common question that, that members ask. And obviously, if ward members are getting feedback from their local communities that they haven't been consulted or that they're not being engaged, um, then the ward members do feed that through to officers. And Councillor Thornborough, I don't, I don't know whether you want to add anything to that. Yes, I, I, I've um, been at some forums when developers have come along to do uh, um, what they've considered presentations and I think it's more it's been more of a gist of a tick box I think the presentations need to be um, 
uh, very well done and they need to go to to the residents in in the right locations at the right time and be well explained so there's a lot of room for improvement on on this and it's it's really important thank you and then another um question from wendy um and you might want to answer this one joanne sorry i'm trying to move out of the way of my cat's paw um does the panel have any accountability i'm not clear yeah so the panel will operate within a terms of reference which will be published on the website um so they they have to operate within that um that's also so part of the, the proposals where we're putting forward that there should be an independent advisory group so that will be made up of people who are experts in design review, the chairs of other panels who will um, essentially assess an annual report into the impact of the, the panel and how they're operating. So yeah, we're, that's something that we're hoping to improve as a result of this review so that they are accountable. Thank you. Um, and then just going down, what requirement will there be, if any, on developers to pay any attention at all? to the responses received from community consultations instead of them being 100% ignored. And I think that's, again, a wider question, and it ties back to the uh, discussion that we've already had. Um, and Councillor Thorne, but I don't, I don't know whether you wanted to say anything about that particular comment. Well, I, I know some... Um... I know some uh, applications have been turned down at planning committee because people, it, um, uh, material considerations have been raised by residents that the committee members felt were um, of such importance that it's influenced, you know, it's um, uh, decisions have been made in accordance what, with what residents have clearly stated. But there have been, there are, there are a whole series of different types of consultations. There are petitions which residents or, or associations can bring regarding a planning application and it comes to the planning committee and they can ask a lot more detail. The petitioners can do a presentation, the developers can ask, answer some questions and the committee members can ask. I, I've, in, in some of those cases, there's been um, um, changes made to take on board the petitioners' considerations there. They're taking seriously those petitions coming, but ideally they should be resolved um, and compromises uh, made and improvements made so before an application is done. So we want a lot more emphasis on pre-application um, presentations and considerations and discussions. The next comment um, is related to that from David Plank, which is much resident concern in new build is about poor quality and how is this being addressed in the Greater Cambridge Share Planning Service. And I know this is something very dear to Councillor Thornborough's heart. <laughs> we discuss this regularly um, with our urban design colleagues as, as well. So um, I think it's it's really important to know though that um, we do, you know, some of the developments within the Cambridge area have won um, design awards. So, you know, and that's national design awards. So there are some some really wonderful um, developments out there, as well as the the poorer quality ones, and and learning the lessons from the um, the developments that haven't worked so well, and how we improve the quality of some of what comes forward um, and dealing with that through the application process. Councillor Thornborough. Yeah, I think um, I think what David's probably referring to is not the quality of the design, but it's more the quality of the build. Um, and there's a, there are problems to do with insulation, numerous, numerous problems. And it's, I personally, I feel that's a lot to do with the dereg deregulation of building control and the inspection regime, regimes. The, um, they are, are much rest, less rigorous and the, uh, the number of inspections required is, is less than it was before. And it's really concerning to, the, to anybody involved in um, uh, trying to provide really good homes. So I'm with the, we're talking more with building control, the local authority building control. We're trying to coordinate the problems that we're hearing about. We're raising it with our MP 
um, in Cambridge and, and the MP in South Camps to try and get them to raise it in Parliament. Um, they, uh, the regulations about the inspections and the expectations of building um, quality must be improved. It's, it's really something we need to fight for, but it's difficult within planning to, um, to deal with that. It's easier possibly to do with building regulations. So we're having on, ongoing conversations and, and I'm really interested to coordinate um, what we hear from residents. Thank you. Uh, there's quite a few related comments in the chat box. So I'm going to move us on to the next item, um, just bearing in mind time, but we'll come back to some more of those comments if we can. And if we can't, then we will um, circulate some responses or comments afterwards. So I'm going to move us on now to the next item, which is a fairly short item. So this is just a quick planning update. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about um, planning committees at the moment and then Charlene Harper, the technical support team, is going to talk a little bit about some changes that we're making um, that residents may become aware of in relation to um, public access. I'll also say a little bit about some of the ICT challenges that I know many of you may have been having with public access and just do a bit of an explanation around that. And then um, uh, we'll talk, we'll move on to the next item. So planning committees, um, just to start with that, uh, many of you will know that we've been um, having virtual meetings all the way through lockdown and that they've been operating very successfully. I think what we've been seeing is actually a lot of people are listening into the virtual planning committees and that significantly increased the accessibility of planning committees to a much wider audience, which is really positive. Unfortunately, um, central government are uh, changing um, the regulations. So um, some people may be aware that there was a high court challenge by another local authority to try and continue with virtual planning committee meetings, but uh, I'm afraid that um, that was quashed. So, we are required to return to meetings in person uh, this month. Uh, we don't have any planning committee meetings in May because of the elections, um, but we are looking at whether we can hold some planning committees, uh, at least a planning committee in June. And we're currently exploring that with democratic services. If we are able to hold a planning committee in June, it's unlikely that that will be at Guildhall. Um, potentially, we are looking at the Corn Exchange um, to see if we could uh, run a committee from the Corn Exchange. So we're working on that with democratic services. If we aren't able to get a committee in June, then uh, we will run two planning committees in July um, to, uh, because obviously we'll have quite a large number of committee items that we need to consider. Uh, we are looking at how the individual arrangements will, um, will happen in terms of supporting those meetings. So we will need to minimise the number of people if a committee takes place in June at the Corn Exchange, actually physically in the building. And so we may have a situation where we need to move people in and out of the building quickly. And we'll keep um, the website updated in relation to those arrangements. Uh, just on the ICT issues, just a quick uh, comment. I know that um, we've had a number of public access upgrades and as part of one of those public access upgrades, what we started to find is as the resilience of our system improved, our system came under attack from what we call web bots. Uh, which are organisations that scrape the system for data. That became a problem, so we had to introduce a protection mechanism for that, which is called recapture. And we know that that gave quite a lot of our customers problems in terms of being able to access public access. So we worked very hard with iDocs and Uniform um, uh, because that's our, our system. So we worked with our infrastructure providers to improve that situation. 
Uh, it's taken quite a few weeks. We also talked to some of the other authorities who've been having similar problems. So we have made significant improvements to that situation. We are aware that there may be a few people who are still having problems. So if you are, then please do contact us and let us know and we'll try and help you with your individual circumstances. So I'm now going to just pass over to Charlene just to give a little update from the technical support team. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Um, yes, just a small update on uh, where the technical support team is with uh, our validation. So we have been working extremely hard to reduce our current backlog. Um, I am pleased to say it is going down um, day by day. Uh, we're currently at uh, three and a half weeks uh, as a backlog. And uh, as I said, we are progressing and, and reducing that um, steadily uh, to help. Um, our pre-apps are currently and have been for the last three months uh, being validated within five days and we have been able to keep that going. Um, with all of this it is due to streamlining of processes in the background to help speed through the validation uh, to get it done and we are continuing to work so um, to progress that further. Uh, other bits that we are currently in process of doing is uh, moving the ad, ad, uh, press advert over from Cambridge Evening News to the Cambridge Independent. Now, we will be putting out communication about this of when we're going to do this, but it's again to help streamline uh, our processes rather than having to do two separate adverts every week. We will be able to one work one into one newspaper and go from there. Uh, the final update I have is we have gone on a, a slight adventure in producing status update emails for all applicants and agents so that when an application is submitted, whether that is electronically or via the planning portal, we are now able to get our system to recognise this and email the applicant and agent to confirm that we have received that application. Now, this is the first step of many, and we will be able to build into the system as, as we go through this year further status updates so that the applicant and agent will know where their application is within, their, within the process to, to keep them up to date. Um, and that is my update if anyone has any questions. Uh, you're on mute, Sharon. Thank you. Thanks, Charlene. I'll just mention a couple of other, other updates. Um, we are shortly um, going out to recruitment for senior planners and planners. Um, so we have been short staffed in recent months, but we're doing a big recruitment and that is imminent. So hopefully we'll be getting some more staff in. Um, the other thing that I would like to mention is we are going to be undertaking a service review. Um, and this is something obviously the shared service has been in place for a few years now. And so what we need to look at is uh, particularly uh, in the early part of the service review, some improvements to the development management process. So we'll be looking at our systems and processes and trying to um, streamline those as much as possible. And uh, a key objective for the service review is very much about improving customer responsiveness. So we are very aware, acutely aware, that we need to improve our customer responsiveness and that we haven't necessarily always been providing the best service in that respect. So there's going to be a real focus on that in some of the changes that we will be looking to bring in, um, particularly looking around also how we can use the website, how we can improve um, automation as Charlene's already touched on. We're doing some early work around that in terms of can we automate some of the responses? We've also started producing, uh, we've, we've made some improvements to. You're on mute again, Sharon. Sorry, that's my cat. 
sorry, my cat just pressed the mute button. Um, so we are uh, making some improvements to the FAQ information that we have on the website. So I do hope you'll be noticing that and um, uh, that that will improve the experience that you are having, but there'll be much more work on that going forward. So that's all I'm going to say on the service review. Nigel, I don't know whether you wanted to add a few words about uh, the changes that we're going to make, be making in relation to amendments that we're looking at at the moment. Yeah, so we're shortly going to be introducing a, a no amendments rule, which is essentially that we will not be accepting any amendments on planning applications that um, that would, would re require any consultation. So in other words, we would only be accepting very minor changes that, that don't need any consultation, fixing errors, that sort of thing. Um, so it doesn't affect the strategic sites team and it wouldn't affect where we've got a planning performance agreement in place. And the reason for this is to try and speed up the determination of some of the applications. Um, we, as you, I'm sure you know, we, we do have some backlogs in development management. So this is um, a six month pilot scheme to, to see whether, what effect it will have on our determination times. So that's probably the main thing, Sharon, to update on. Thanks. Thank you. Um... There's no specific questions in the uh, Councillor Thornber would like to say something. Thank you, Councillor Thornber. I just say a, a little bit more about what uh, the update Nigel's done, Nigel said. So I think sometimes um, there are quite a lot of, you, you may have come across quite a lot of changes during the course of an application and the residents, um, it's sometimes difficult to keep uh, informed about the changes. And this is, um, what the what we really want what we're hoping for is um much more time and effort put into pre-application where any um issues to do with overlooking overshadowing um at the setting um consultations with neighbors is done uh, uh better beforehand so that uh, it's once it's uh, submitted with all the right documentation it should be much more straightforward and it will either be it should be then approved because any issues would have been resolved beforehand. What we, we're trying to stop this um, um, applications being submitted quite quickly with the expectation that if there is any problem with neighbors or light, it, it can be changed during the course of the application. That takes a lot of our resources and it means um, sometimes the uh, it aggravates the neighbourly relationships as well because of the ch change after change. So we're trying to um, stream like that, but it also we also aim to help applicants as well so that they know um, our expectations are resolve all of the issues beforehand and then it'll be smooth um, way through. Um, thank you. I think if I could add, Sharon, as well, it's, it, it's also about trying to encourage the agents to put in better quality applications. So, you know, quite often they'll put in a poor submission and it feels like we're doing all the work trying to improve it and make it make it better. So it's putting more emphasis on on the agents putting forward good schemes, because if they don't, you know, we won't be changing them, then they will be refused. Thanks. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I'm just going to pick up, um, there's, there are some design review questions that I think we may need to follow up after the meeting, given the time, um, but I'm just going to pick up one from Wendy, um, because it's, it's slightly related to development management in the uh, border sense. So uh, Wendy said the big issue is enforcement, rules and regulations. How do design panels address this regarding applications, not just design panels, but across the service? And this is such an issue. Um, I wondered if it might be useful, and I'd be interested if people put feedback on the chat box, um, whether if we make the focus of um, part of the focus of the next uh, meeting that we have about planning enforcement generally, and we could perhaps have a, a part of a theme against that and invite some of the planning enforcement officers along. Obviously, the question is meant in the broader sense, and it picks up some of the points that Councillor Thornborough has already made about um, it's also to do with other regulations and things like the deregulation of building control and, um, you know, some of, some of that 
that the outcomes that we've seen across the city that result from that. Um, also, I think, um, you know, there is an issue of resourcing, being honest, because um, ensuring compliance um, in relation to um, many detailed matters can be very, very time consuming. Um, and a lot of local authorities are obviously feeling the pinch in relation to resources in their planning services and we're not unique at all in, in that respect. Um, we do use our building control team to help us um, with our monitoring on our strategic sites. Um, so we work very closely with building control um, uh, and they go around and, and, and look at particular issues that arise on our strategic sites and they focus on those strategic sites. So, you know, we will be talking to building control and working with building control to see whether there's any opportunities to be able to expand that process. Councillor Thornbro, I don't know whether he wants to add anything to that. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I have to leave in a couple of minutes, um, but um, we do put on the um, planning approvals that conditions must be discharged. It is, it's a legal requirement and uh, the majority of um, people wanting buildings built and the builders do, uh, do, do things properly. But there are, there are, recently we know there was a case where there was blatant um, contraventions of the conditions. Um, sometimes it may be that the, the applicants aren't aware, um, maybe the architects or engineers or consultants aren't aware of what's happening on site, but it is, it is their responsibility. Um, and the um, applicant should be ensuring that their consultants are um, em employed, uh, carrying out their inspections that are needed. Um, so sometimes if there is, when there is blatant um, uh, contraventions, then we do need to come in on board. Although ideally we would, we'd be able to contact the applicants and they would actually realize that they're in contra, you know, they should be losing face and actually, you know, doing it properly. And because they have to live with neighbors and everyone going forward, but where it's blatant, we do want to uh, carry out enforcement and we want to ensure that the conditions are clear so that the work of the enforcement officers is as easy as possible. So we have been reviewing the wording of the conditions so that um, enforcement can be black and white and they can actually be um, carry it out as quickly as possible. But we do know there's room for improvement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to talk very quickly about one project update and then we'll try and deal with as many of the outstanding questions as we have. So in terms of project updates, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the planning advisory service review. So some of you will be aware, I think we mentioned at the last Residents Association Forum meeting that uh, both South Cambridgeshire and Cambridge City Council jointly commissioned the planning advisory service to carry out a review of our planning committees. Um, that was delayed because of lockdown. So the review by the planning advisory service was carried out during the late autumn and um, uh, uh, finished early uh, this year in January. And there was a residence focus group session as part of that review and the planning advisory service engaged with a number of stakeholders, including planning committee members and local ward members, as well as um, residents. And they also um, engaged with a number of officers, including planning officers and legal officers who attend the committee. Uh, the reports in relation to the planning uh, advisory service review have been published and they were considered. So the City Council Planning Committee considered the review at its committee on the 24th of March and the Joint Development Control Committee, uh, as we said, con considered strategic site developments, considered the planning advisory service review on the 14th of April. 
So I'd really encourage everyone to look at those reports and look at the recommendations in the planning advisory service review reports. Um, we'll so collate some links after this meeting uh, and then um, it's really useful. So there are a number of recommendations that the planning advisory service made about improvements that we can make to our planning committee to make them more accessible to people uh, and to improve engagement, but also to streamline the planning committee process. And certain one of the recommendations is to review the scheme of delegation. And I'm just going to pick up a point uh, that's in the chat box. So Wendy has said, how do these changes relate to applications being called in? Does that still apply? Uh, yes, it, it does, you know, it does apply. Uh, there aren't any changes to the call in uh, procedures at the moment. Um, but obviously, if we move forward on a scheme of delegation review, um, then that may form part of the scheme of delegation review. So that's that's my update. So I think, um, Nigel, is there anything you want to update quickly on? If you have many yeah, a just, bit short of time. <laughs> yeah, just very, very briefly. Um, we're working on a number of improvements to the service. And a lot of those are internal, so I won't I won't um, raise them here. Um, but just to say um, duty officer is one of those. So we're trying to provide more information for householders. So for, for a residents who are thinking of extending their house, um, we have that we have that service, but we've we've been looking at um, providing far more information on the website. So we hope to do that in the future. Um, the Section 106 legal agreement process we're reviewing, and we hope that that will allow us to put some information on the website to avoid you having to ask us questions about that sometimes and we'll give you more information um, and then and we're and in terms of communication we're looking at various options where we can improve our our communication one idea is having dedicated time slots where we where we make ourselves available for direct communication so that's a very very um, quick tour around about 10 projects that we're currently working on in development management thanks Thank you, um, Nigel. So um, there's a couple of questions, I think, in the chat box. Um, I think there's there's more individual comments, which we will take away after this meeting. So there's an application uh, there about Newnham Mill, um, which uh, submitted over a year ago, still not being determined. Um, six applications to fell TPO trees there to facilitate the development. Residents wonder why it's not being decided, allowing the developers to make the repeated attempts, and that's from Jean Glasberg. So I think if we can follow up on that one after the meeting, Nigel, that would probably be the best way to deal with that. Thank you. Um, and then I think, uh, David, you want to talk about, you've got a question on the local plan, the next stage. How will the consultation in the autumn on the preferred options be handled? What kind of structure will there be to encourage engagement of and responses from residents? John did you, or Caroline, did you want to pick that one up? Uh, so unfortunately, Hannah, who is our, our communications expert, had to leave a bit early and she would answer this far better than me. But we're very much looking to learn lessons from the last stage where we tried an awful lot of new things last year. Um, we made a lot of improvements working on our website to make sure that's even easier uh, to make comments at the next stage. Um, we've had quite a lot of um, success with our, our webinar approach. We're looking to use that again. Um, as to face-to-face -to -face events, I think we will be looking to open that up. It's all slightly in the air at the moment, as you'll appreciate, but very much we are looking at what to do uh, next and work on that again. Um, and looking again, how we make our material um, as accessible as possible and, and spread the word as much as possible. So welcome to have any suggestions and feedback and how, how we do that, but we're definitely looking to, you know, do even more than we did last time. Thanks, John. And then I'm going to pick up a few of the questions that came through before the meeting. So I've got a few questions here from David Plank. So I'm going to answer those. So the first question from David is, when will the council assume responsibility for Hobson's Park and its community allotments? I have some good news on that, I'm very pleased to say. So the Clay Farm allotments and Hobson Park lease 
uh, agreement was completed on the 12th of May. Um, and so we've now issued um, allotment agreements to people on the waiting list. So really good news and aware that this has been a very long time coming. Uh, so that's a real milestone. I'm really pleased about that. So another question from David, what action is being taken by the council's antisocial behaviour team with the Police and Housing Association to control the actions of individuals engaged in continuing bicycle theft and vandalism in Trumpington? Apparent inaction is creating tension among residents. I asked Vicky Hayward in the City Community Development Team who at the City Council um, and she gave me the following uh, details. So, um, Mr. Uh, so the community safety team uh, work very closely with the police and housing associations and other agencies to tackle nuisance and antisocial behaviour across the city. Uh, they do rely on issues being reported to them directly, so it's important for, to get in touch with them and they then are able to build up a wider picture of what's happening and to be able to advise on appropriate action. When they receive a number of complaints about a specific area, they then discuss those issues in their problem solving group. And that's a multi-agency meeting which meets once a month to look at antisocial behavior, hotspot areas. But if there are specific issues, David, or any other residents want to raise, um, then um, um, Marianne Crozier, the senior community safety officer, will be very pleased to help you. Um, there's also a uh, link that's been provided, a, a, a contact uh, email details, so we'll circulate those um, after the meeting. Thank you. I'm just going to have a quick check in the chat box to see whether uh, there are any further questions. I think there's still some comments from the design review that we haven't uh, dealt with. Um, so I'll just go back to that if you don't mind, Joanne, because uh, we might as well sweep those up while we can. Um, so Robert Lowson felt that our response in relation to engagement with residents in the design review is unconvincing and should there not be a resident panel process in parallel with the expert one? I think let us take that away. It is something that's starting to be done in some other local authorities, but it's quite a new thing. So I think we need to see actually how that's working elsewhere um, and understand sort of what sorts of projects we would be able to apply that to in Cambridge um, and, and who we would have on that panel, because obviously it would require quite a lot of training um, around design. So it would be quite an undertaking for us, but it's it's certainly something that we can we can take away and discuss. Thank you. That's great. And then I think, just looking at that, uh, David, you've reminded us all not to call Clay Farm Development Great Knighton and that it's Trumpington. Great Knighton is a countryside marketing concept, totally agree, uh, with no roots in the community. And <coughs> obviously we have Hobson's Park and we have the Clay Farm Centre. Um, on the clay farm development. So yes, that's uh, really important to remind everybody. Um, and then a comment from Jean about the, again, the Silver Street Loos, which were reviewed by the panel, but they seemed unaware of important issues, which were then raised by residents in a DCF. Um, the applicant in this case was the city council, which we're all aware of. Um, so I'm sure that um, this is something that can be picked up, Joanne, through the uh, set up of the new arrangements in terms of making sure that there is that tracking process. Um, but, um, and then there's a more general design question, uh, if you wouldn't mind answering that. Uh, how does the lifetime of proposed designs get taken into account? There seems to be a proliferation of officers with an expected life of 30 years. Surely this should be challenged for climate change reasons. Yeah, I mean, certainly in terms of our design review panel at the moment, we don't have very, um, well, we don't have anyone with sustainability expertise on the panel. So when we recruit a new panel, that's something that we will be certainly looking um, for experts in sustainability who will be able to kind of challenge developers bringing forward proposals that don't 
last longer than you know 30 years um yeah so that that should be improved for the new panel I think just to butt in there I think that it's a quite a difficult area for, for planning to deal with because obviously we can only work within the limits of the legislation um, available I do have to say though one of the evidence documents we'll be bringing out um, alongside the preferred options is um, a net zero carbon study so you might have seen we published sort of a first element of that back in November and when we when we come out with the next stage it'll be a more comprehensive study looking at all the areas the plan could do to tackle climate change um, within the realms of the legislation we have available. And that certainly looks into those issues about um, embodied carbon uh, in buildings, and the lifetime of buildings, and even what you might be able to do um, with buildings when they end their life. And, and there are limits to what we can do, but it explores what we might be able to do within policy within those limits. So there'll certainly be opportunities to comment on that at that next stage as well. Thank you. And then I think lastly, I think we picked up most of the other questions. There's a comment there about new allotments and the need to focus on organic gardening. So some of the new developments. So I think obviously we're working with the developers to um, think about how we can introduce some of the issues around um, improving environmental quality, which includes food growing and how we can um, engage with the developers and that they can engage with the local community. So I know certainly with the um, allotments on Clay Farm, there's been a, a significant amount of engagement with that local community in relation to uh, those community gardens and allotments and how they should be laid out and how they should be organised. And uh, we'd really like to look at how that works on some of the other sites that we're bringing forward. Obviously, the Darwin Green development that's highlighted there has come forward um, quite slowly and some of the um, open spaces aren't available yet. And we're working with the developers uh, in relation to the phasing of that development currently. I think that's probably um, ah, yes. So uh, just a couple ones I'll try and pick up. Um, so David, yes, thank you for your comments. And I think it's a really good idea to invite someone from the council along to attend your, your meeting in relation to the antisocial behaviour issues. And then finally, I think a question from Wendy, a comment, given the Whitehall pressure on local authorities to deliver growth now, how do you propose to address the water issue? So John, I don't know whether you just want to make a comment on that last question. So again, you'll have seen, we published the first stage of our integrated water study uh, back in November. That study will now move on to the full study. And one of the key issues that we're looking at is for whatever growth that is planned, how we make sure water can be delivered in a sustainable manner and how that can be evidenced. Uh, alongside that, you'll be aware that um, Water Resources East are developing their regional plan water supplies which provides the opportunity to look at how water can be supplied on a wider basis than simply the Cambridge area to look at where more sustainable uh, supplies can be brought in particularly in the longer term so there's an awful lot going on in that area and we'll look to continue to evidence uh, that and provide that at the next stages going forward. Thank you so that brings us to the end of this evening's meeting if there are any questions that were sent in before the meeting that we haven't covered, then we will share responses to those after the meeting. I think there were a couple of quite long questions that we had in advance that we will provide answers for after the meeting. If there's anything else in the chat box that we haven't covered, then uh, if there's any, anything else, and I'm sure Joanne will be looking at that feedback in particular on the design review process. Um, and looking at that and going through that and thinking about that as we move forward. But otherwise, I hope everyone has found this meeting helpful and informative and um, look forward to the next one. We'll definitely have a focus. So we'll bring along some representation from the planning enforcement team and we'll use part of the meeting as a focus for planning enforcement. Beverly, I don't know whether we've got a date for the next resident association meeting or whether we can follow that up after the, the meeting. Yes, can we follow up after the meeting? That's great. Yes. 
Thank you. So we will um, provide the, uh, an indicative date for the next meeting uh, with all the information. And then, so finally, just wanted to say good evening to everybody. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you very much for making the time to attend this session. Again, hope it was very use hope it was useful for you. And yes, thank you to Beverly for setting it all up. Good night, everybody. Good night.